just putting out listicles is just mm. you're just wasting your time. Only your mom is going to read that stuff. <laughs> Hey everyone, I am Lee McKnight Jr. I'm the VP of Sales for RSWUS. We're an outsourced business development firm for ad agencies and PR firms of all types. And this is Cut to the Chase. It's the RSW interview series that delivers brief but impactful, impactful views from ad agency principals and business development leaders on growth strategies and the challenges that come with them in today's weird, evolving landscape. Mike Casey, president at Tigercom in Tyson's Corner, Virginia. Welcome, sir. Thanks for having me. Yeah, yeah, we we uh, we have talked a lot over the years. Mike is extremely helpful in sending me sales emails. His replies are amazing. Uh, he's become legendary in my mind. <laughs> he does not suffer fools as he should not, uh, and I do appreciate that. Yeah, he just sends them on. It's 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 pretty cool. But uh, welcome. Uh, you can tell it's Friday. I flubbed the intro. That's okay. <laughs> so we're going to get into your firm, uh, Tigercom, and, and some of the great content that you're doing and all that good stuff. But as we do, first, we're going to have some rapid fire questions, Mike. Now, I did not give you these, so you don't know what's coming, uh, but should be fun. Okay, you ready? I'm on. Ready. All right. First one, Ohio State Buckeyes or Kentucky Wildcats? I am one of the few people in America who does not follow college or professional sports because okay. because I play a sport and it takes all my time. So I, I couldn't tell you and I have no preference. OK, but you did go to Ohio State, correct? I did. And I sold my football tickets for book money. So I, I'm, 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 a, I'm I, you're, you're outing me as a traitor to my sports cause. <laughs> but see, I didn't know that. That's right in our backyard, right? We're in Cincy. So that's pretty cool. Right on. OK. Okay, next, uh, Murder, She Wrote, or Golden Girls? Uh, how about the Dao Dei Chang? <laughs> okay, love it. Uh, next, this is a weird one, uh, Squid or Haggis, if you had to pick one to eat? I'm going to intermittent fast, Lee, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I just can't go there. <laughs> <laughs> Two more. My, my, uh, my, my people are from the better a better island in the British Isles, and we don't do that sort of thing. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, uh, Roadrunner or Wild E. Coyote? Um, I think Wild E. Coyote. Okay, Roadrunner annoys me, so I'm with you there. Last one: answering an RFP or receiving 21 paper cuts? Uh, paper cuts, and <laughs> with an alcohol bath following for sure. <laughs> I was going to add that in, but yeah, we, yeah. we, we, we have a no RFP policy and, and I, and I having, <laughs> having recently made an exception on that, I, at the end of that oh, experience, did. yeah, it was, and I just, I said to our team, as long as I run this firm and draw breath, we will never make another exception regardless of money, person or opportunity or, or hunger in our, in our guts. Never again. And I actually, we actually wrote a piece about why we didn't, and you might want to share with those put in the show notes. It's called um, Dear sure. RFPs, Here's Why Creative Professionals Aren't Really Into You. You can Google it, but I'll, I'll send I it your it. way. But yeah, I just, here's the fundamental reason. I say this for both the agencies and the, and the institutional communicators that listen. The RFP does not measure what you need it to measure. So hmm. when, you're on the, when you're on the institutional side of the table, you're looking for people who can think, listen, and and execute well. The RFP measures none of those things. Mm -hmm. What it does instead is measures who gives good meeting. And that <laughs> means that big firms that overcharge and are churn and burn shops take part of the skim and they invest it into templatized business development meetings. And yeah. 84% of the time, the RFP issuer already knows who they want to hire. So there's a <laughs> bunch sure. of downsides for the institutional communicator. You're not you're going to give you're going to get a good performance team, which is very unlikely to serve your account. Yeah. And for the agency side, you are basically signing up for a suckers game. <laughs> I'm in. Yeah, uh, do send that piece, and we'll put a link in there for folks never, watching. Never, never again. 
Yeah. Good for you. Don't do it. Um, okay, so we're going to get into the firm uh, and deep experience. Uh, one of, certainly one of the reasons why I wanted you on in clean tech and renewable, renewable energy. But before we do, for, for folks watching, give us a brief bit about your background. Because I And correct me if I'm wrong here. I believe you started out in political issue communications. Is that correct? That's right. I, I've been a professional communicator for 39 years. And my first decade in the business was as a spokesman for... Um, elected officials and people who wanted to be elected officials mm. at the state and the federal level. And okay. I spent another decade plus building and running communications operations in the environmental community. And along that second part of my career, I had three slow realizations. We were trying to say no to things, but we <laughs> didn't have anything to say yes to. So we had a, we had a gap in the narrative. The okay. second realization was we had a gap in the infrastructure to deliver that narrative. And the third is we had a skills and attitude gap. We were, we as climate tech advocates were advocating for something with subpar messaging, not a, not a will to win, but what I call the disease of principal loserism. And <laughs> we, and a lot of magical thinking. And I just was not okay with that combination and set out to try yeah. to figure out how can I contribute to addressing those three gaps and okay. the solution I came to was starting this firm. So that's why it nice. exists. Okay. Love it. So let's, let's, uh, before we jump in TigerCom, I should say, um, another kind of icebreaker here. Uh, what is the craziest, weirdest, oddest thing a client has ever asked or, or requested in your experience? Well, I should note that 90% of the people we work with in clean economy are good folks. And I'd say a good 75% of them are just downright smart and inspiring. So we're sure. talking about a sliver. Okay. So there's a lot of examples I can give you that would be simple, basically would be podcast porn. I don't think, I don't know if it serves that much of a purpose, but, but here's, let me try to give a more meaningful answer to your listeners. I think okay. that there are, perhaps we should look at what behaviors have some common commonality to them that do not serve institutional communicators. And I would say the number one thing we run into on the downside is young points of contact who are hmm. not comfortable, not knowing as much as we do. And when you hire a vertically positioned firm, you should be hiring them for their expertise. By definition, they should know more than you. And it's okay not knowing. It's okay owning that you don't know. And I'll, I'll say that I, I think where this unhelpfully translates is I've seen is in the last 18 months, I think I've seen three different accounts where young client points of contact were <clears throat> in effect sabotaging their company and their boss's interest because they were, they were they were trying to play water polo and hold our heads under the water because they didn't yeah. want to really admit they didn't know what they were doing. And it's actually okay not knowing what you're doing. I too was sure. once young and, and had imposter syndrome. It's fairly common, <laughs> but it's like, it's okay to actually not know more than people who've been at this for a really long time that I, I want to be, I, I want to be clear. <clears throat> that doesn't mean that we who, who are aspiring to, subject matter mastery should be a bunch of finger waggers and either in our minds and or verbally because i think once you start seeing yourself as a subject matter master you're on track to stop being one hmm. if you're going to be a subject matter master you need to combine it with what the zen buddhist called the beginner's mind you 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 master and then you learn and you master and you learn and it's a never-ending feedback loop and you when you get off it because you think you're older than them or you know more than them that's as an as a service provider you're kind of sliding to the edge of the account death pit and you don't want to do that but on the institutional communicator side you you want to hire people who know more than you and it's okay not to know absolutely it, and when you have when you're a poser you're getting in the way of your own professional development so so imposing is a losing strategy in the medium and long term. I'm not even clear it gives you any benefits in the short term. <laughs> it is true in life as well. And yeah, you've given us already some great quote material. I love that answer. Um, let's dig in to TigerCom 19 years in, correct? Yep. And I mentioned to you before we jumped on. So I, I 
I'm surprised I never asked you this, but where, where does the name come from? Let's start there. Yeah, so we, I didn't want to name the place after myself because I wanted to be bigger than me and I didn't want to be just principal associates. I thought that was, it was egocentric branding at best. I thought it was hmm. limiting branding at worst. And, okay. but I think the name, tigers are an apex predator. They are, they are what they call megafauna in bio and bio, biological circles. If you, if you get the megafauna conservation right, you get a lot of things right underneath it. So if we, as a firm, communicate with speed and agility and power, hmm. we will be doing a lot of things right because you have to have subject matter knowledge, tactical expertise, a humility and a listening to get to that style. So we thought, hey, if we can aspire to those qualities, we have to do a lot of things right to be like the animal we're named after. We also tithe 1% to Siberian tiger conservation and kind of a fun fact, if you ever, oh, read, nice. the, if you ever read the book, The Tiger by John Valiant, which is, I, I warn you, do not start reading it at 9.30 at night because three o'clock in the morning will come on your last page and you'll not be able to put it down. But the, the whole thing is okay. basically Jaws in real life involving a Siberian tiger in a range in a, in a poacher who shoots one. And it's the tiger basically gets the poacher and then it's all about the rangers trying to get the tiger who's now a wounded man eater. We bought the ranger in that story. We bought him his truck he uses. So really? it's kinda, yes, it's very cool. His name's Yuri. So anyway, wow. very cool. Okay, yep. that is very cool. I am glad I asked. That's that's neat. Um, well, let's, let's dig a little deeper. So I, and I'm pulling a quote from your site. You know, it says, you built it to provide an intense, intensive level of service designed for companies, organizations, and leaders working in clean energy and sustainability. Now, we ask this question in, in every one of these, and, and so that certainly is your point of difference. It's a point of difference. Um, and, and is that typically when asked, you know, what, what is Tigercom's main point of difference? Is that how you typically describe it? I think so. We, we set out overtly to take agency expertise and execution services and comport them for the needs of clean economy disruptors. And the reality is that most of our folks are not forging new industries. They're forging new sectors within industries that are dominated by powerful incumbents that are not going to just fork over market share to more effective market players they are going to weaponize disinformation and propaganda and influence peddling with government to try to play water polo and hide and hold our folks heads underwater so we we expressly set out to help the clean economy disruptors displace incumbents in the act of creative destruction that is capitalism wow yeah and and you're you're not a traditional pr firm in in that sense um, so on LinkedIn, for example, and I thought this was pretty interesting, you describe yourselves as a number of ways, but helping company, companies to turbocharge their sales, narrate their company to investors and executives, secure fair treatment from policymakers, and win community approval for renewable projects. When you're asked, uh, you know, your elevator pitch, if you will, uh, what, what is it typically? Yeah, we're, we're America's number one Marcom and public affairs firm servicing clean economy companies. Nice. Perfect. Succinct. I love that. You did not go on for 12 sentences like many firms do. That's impressive. Uh, it's like you've done it before, Mike. I think so. <laughs> I got I to gotta check the logbook, but I think so. <laughs> I love it. Okay. So, so at RSW here, when we work with our clients, we talk about needing to show prospects, you know, your value as a firm immediately. And it doesn't always have to be that singular expertise, but Talk about expertise. I mean, there is no confusion about yours and what you all do, the type of companies you help. From a business development standpoint, I mean, it sounds like you've already kind of answered this question to an extent. From the moment you set out and you created it, it has to help being so laser focused. Correct? Yeah, I think vertical positioning invites the vertical, the vertically focused to develop expertise. That doesn't mean you're going to, but it invites you to do that. And if yeah. you're, if you, if you lean into vertical positioning, you're narrowing what you're doing enough that to keep it interesting, you need to do something to keep it more than just a job. And for us, it was to learn better than anyone else on the planet, 
How do you help clean economy companies through communications win with customers, markets and investors, and policymakers? Okay. And I'm now confident after 19 years, we, we, we have succeeded in that. We are the, the world's leading experts in this really, really specialized thing. Yeah. And for agencies, I will say that that, that comes with a plethora of benefits. Yeah. If you can see your way to leaning into a niche area of expertise and knowing it cold and then combining it with that beginner's mindset, you produce a raft of benefits. The first is the work is just more fun. I mean, there, there's something really that's that's deeply fulfilling about working up to the very limits of your intellectual abilities. I, I think mine are fairly modest, but like really going up to the edge of them is it, it's it leaves you feeling full at the end of the day. And I okay. think that's a win in and of itself. I think when you are in overt committed pursuit of knowledge and expertise in a subject matter area, it also has a benefit of enabling you to say meaningful things to the marketplace. Sure. And that then, if well said, creates an inbound pipeline. And that inbound pipeline in turn creates an abundance, a sense of abundance. And that sense of abundance allows you more selection in who you work for. In short, there is a several links in the chain that go from vertical positioning to not having to work for assholes. And it's not the only, that's not the reason you do it, but like it is a side benefit. You get to say no to assholes. Absolutely. Uh, I love it. And that might be the quote of the podcast so far, but uh, so let me ask, you know, it's interesting, and especially during COVID talking to certain agencies and PR firms that said, you know, we were generalists before and it really helped us during, um, we, we love being the generalist and then others who are kind of on the fence and are like, I, maybe we'll pull the trigger. Uh, you know, is there one piece of advice that you would give to those individuals who maybe are sitting on the fence um, thinking about, OK, are we going to move into this particular sector, for example? Any advice you'd give them? Yeah, I, th I think recognize that either is an is a is an acceptable, honorable choice. Be a sure. generalist, be a specialist. Either is okay. If you choose to be a generalist, you are basically prohibited from being an expert firm. You are a really good arms and legs service provider. And just own that and be okay with it. If you're, if you're a generalist in your focus, if you're billing off hours, if you're competing for RFPs, you're going to get what everybody else has ever done. Everybody else who's done those things is going to get you. You're not going to get that benefit set that I just rattled off. And yeah. that's okay because there are benefits of being a journalist. You can go after all sorts of work and sure. whatever. But I think here's the actionable advice, Lee, that you're after. The best I can give to my counterparts who are weighing this decision are you at a point in your career where you are drawn to the idea that you want to be a subject matter master? And I was very drawn to it because, you know, the people that we work for are, I mean, they are so smart and they're inspiring and they are, they are pushing massive boulders uphill. And I'm in love with that because they are, they're doing something tangible and impactful on the greatest crisis humanity has ever faced. Yeah. And they're doing it at considerable professional risk because, you know, starting companies is not easy as, as, as you well know. And yeah. so to me, those people are so inspiring that they need people who are equally as committed to sector success as they are. And for me, the choice is easy. I, you know, I came into this as a mission focused person and we built the team accordingly. And, but I will say the, perhaps the other benefit to vertical positioning and committing to subject matter mastery is it is so cool to work with a team of people who are really focused on knowing how to do this difficult thing. And you're, you kind of have each other's backs and you know that you're in the presence of other deeply experted people. 
And that's a cool thing to do every day. Yeah. I love that answer. And it's, uh, it, it's inspiring, actually. It's, it's pretty cool to hear you say that. And, and I agree with you because the intent of the question was certainly not to say, and, and you said it better than I ever could, that being a generalist is, is necessarily a bad thing. Uh, it can totally work for you. However, you know, in our mind, at least, whether it's focusing on a specific vertical, you've got to at least have that focus. And I think that's where a lot of generalist agencies from a business development standpoint sometimes lose that thread and they don't really have a good understanding of really who they are. And if you don't, then you're not going to be able to tell a prospect, for example, very well how you can help them. So I think that's a great answer. Um, it leads in very nicely in the next question, which I mean, without a doubt, and anyone, and we're going to have several links, by the way, for folks watching to your content, to the site. I mean, you walk that walk without a doubt, your passion it shows through, not just in speaking to me right now, but in your LinkedIn post, even for example, I wanted to tick off some of the, the areas where you all, in terms of content and just everything you're doing to give folks watching, uh, uh an idea because it's impressive. Uh, I'll tick some of these off. So, and, and if I've gotten any of these incorrect, please tell me, but you have the scaling clean blog that's dedicated to the advancement of the clean economy, scaling clean podcast launched in March 22. That's where clean economy CEOs, investors, the people who advise them, and then quarterly roundtables with clean tech editors, reporters, and podcasters, a CTLR investors roundtable, uh, and then three more things. A contributor to Recharge, that's the world's leading provider of business intelligence for renewable energy industries. You're on the board at Breeze Incorporated, which we can have a whole thing just on this. I'm fascinated by this company. We don't have time to get into it, but they reuse idle pipelines to move compressed air. I think that's, I was reading more about this and it's fascinating. Lastly, and if I'm saying this correctly, RE+, which is the largest and most comprehensive event in North America for the clean energy industry, pretty heavily involved there, it looks like. So that's probably not even everything, Mike, but I mean, we've talked about it. Firms struggle to keep up with just content of, of any sort, but that awareness and that expertise, uh, it, it's invaluable. Um, tell me all these things that you all are doing. Number one, it's got to be pretty important because you're so passionate about it. Tell me how important it is to you and the team, but then also... Which one of those from a business development standpoint, can you pinpoint any one of those that probably helps drive the most new business for you? It's mm, a good question. So first off, thanks for the kind words. And at, at RE Plus, we, we're, 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 I guess, frequent speakers. That's our only official roles okay. we go, is we're up on stage sometimes and, and give gotcha. presentations. But, you know, we're competing for those slots and you got you to gotta earn your way there. Sure. But I think um, I, I also was a... Uh, what they call the first member of the Clean Tech Leaders Roundtable, that's CTLR. It's um, started by two friends of mine, uh, Jigger Shaw and Jake Sussman, to basically provide a networking platform for people in clean tech. But to go okay. to the nitty gritty answers on your questions, I think your question begs another one in the mind of the agency owner. I I'm, I'm working, I'm already pulling 50 hours a week. Yeah. How do you do this? This seems daunting. So one, I would say start narrow and start, stay in your aerobic zone. Don't go anaerobic in your, the output you aspire to. Number two, you're going to know if you want to do this because you're going to wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you're going to get an idea for something to say. If yeah. you do that, then you know your heart is in the expression. Number three, don't check boxes on content. Just putting out listicles is just, mm. you're just wasting your time. Only your mom is going to read that stuff because it's just everything, <laughs> right? So the thing is, can particularly on LinkedIn, I mean, Lee, you've been, you've been articulate about this, that you have all these people who are treating LinkedIn like a used car sales lot. And it's just yeah. all you're doing is clogging pipes and you're, you're mm -hmm. chewing your time. So better you speak four times a year and it's actually insightful and meaningful and a little bold than doing a bunch of listicle content. So the difference, I, I think I'm going to, I'm going to credit David Baker and Blair ends with this. Yeah, they're great. And I think David Miriam and Scott also, I think, um, mm. was what I learned a lot from him on this. The difference between content and insight is content checks boxes. Insight tells the audience something useful and new about themselves they did not know. And 
only speak in the public square when you have an insight to share. Mm. Now, I, you know, I made a conscious choice that I'm going to, I have no problems throwing elbows um, at what I see as, as uh, companies are committing crimes against future generations. Like I, you know, I'm overt. I do not like ExxonMobil. I think it's a legalized criminal enterprise. I don't have a problem shin kicking them. And if people don't like that because they just want PR people to do happy talk, I'm not your guy because yeah. I just think we're, we're too late in the planetary hour to be getting to, to be wallowing in the tradition of PR niceties. And I think the rule of thumb perhaps is if you're going to post something on LinkedIn, are you doing look at me, you know, proud and humble to be speaking to such and such? Thanks. Love that. Three friends a year is in your mommy are going to go, yay. But if you say, I spoke at this thing, and here's the thing I think is a benefit to you, then you're in the zone of insight. And so to me, the coaching I would give other agency owners is kind of a series of gating choices. Do you feel compelled to say something that others aren't saying that delivers value to your target audience? Yes or no? And if it's no, yeah. just be a horizontally positioned generalist. It's okay. Yeah. Number two, are you willing to be a little bit afraid to say what you're going to say? If you're not, you're probably being too timid and bland and listicle oriented. Number three, can you clear the criterion of insight? If you can do those three things, then you have the internal composition to, to be successful at thought leadering with all the attendant benefits, inbound pipeline, more fun, and the ability to say no to bad fit clients. Mm. But if you don't, it's okay. Like it's, it, and mind you, it, let's not get around the reality. There is a CapEx that you spend as an agency owner. You are going to do, when you first get started, a lot of your thought leadering. You're going to be doing it on nights and weekends when you'd rather be watching Netflix, hanging out with your kids, or taking a walk. Like, you're going to do that. But it's sort of like, it's a CapEx, not an OpEx. There is an OpEx involved, but the CapEx is big, and then it tailors off. And then it's more sustainable. Okay. I love that advice. And we're going to post all three of those. Uh, I think that is fantastic. I want to touch on something else, or maybe better way to phrase it is ask you a little bit further for folks watching on top of that advice, just tactically, how, how do you do it? Is, is it all mapped out fairly specifically, you know, this month we're doing X or is it a little more loose in terms of, because I would think, I think I know the answer because you, you, you're doing so much. I'm not sure how you're getting it all done, but for agency owners looking at that, just tactically, how is it set up? It's planned with tent posts with lots of space in between for okay. middle of the night inspirations. Okay. <laughs> I love it. You know, you, Ali, I, sorry, I didn't answer your question. You asked me what brings in the best result and the short oh, answer right. is, yes. the sh- Thank short, you. Short answer is, I don't know. I, okay. I don't I don't know how to discern that because we don't have a point of purchase website. Yeah. Okay. And I think there's some combination of what we're doing that works and there's oh, another thing I would also say is let go of the sense you need to be on all social platforms. It just I, I have written <laughs> I'm I, in. I'm I'm really clear about this. In my life I've written two tweets. I'm not on Twitter. And it's not because it's not because daddy's going crazy in real time, on, you know, is at the head of the ship. But it's just yeah. because Twitter, Twitter, I have people at the shop who get Twitter and Twitter experts. Okay. I I have chosen LinkedIn as a thing I'm really going to get. And I use my own thought leadering as a way of treating me like my crash test dummy for my clients. Like if I can do it and it works, then I know the principles will work for my client CEOs. And so yeah. if I don't do it on myself or if I don't have a colleague that does it for, for us or for him or her, then who are we to advise it? You know, we're just posing and I don't want to do that. Yeah. Uh, such great advice. And I, I mean, I am this close to dropping our Twitter feed because it's useless. I feel like, and not because to your point also, not because necessarily what's going on, uh, with that shit show, uh, but um, 
I, I love that. And, and also know what you're good at in terms of, and kind of touching on what you had said earlier, I, I know that Instagram, I'm never going to do very well on there, but it doesn't mean it's maybe not something we should explore. And we have, and we have someone on our team, Kiana, who does a fantastic job for us there. Right. I never, I never need to touch that. And I am a okay with that. You know, it's like, right. let the people that are good at it, let them do their thing. Um, kind of similar to, to what you'd said earlier. Um, so unbelievably we're at the last question and, uh, you know, this, this, uh, call it a podcast almost, it's really not, interview series, does go out to marketers as well. So I wanna give a little bit of focus over, over there. And with this final question, uh, you had sent me a piece yesterday that I think is really good. It, I don't believe it's posted yet, but it will be, nope. correct? Yeah. Okay, and we'll, we'll make sure we get it, because I think it's, for agency owners, it's very much worth a read. But the, So let me ask the question, then we'll get into it. But um, if you could give one piece of advice to, a, a client, it could be a marketer, whatever or, you know uh, that that client looks like and the title looks like, to make the working relationship with their firm or their agency better and more effective. What's the one piece of advice you would give that that marketer, for example? I think both sides of the table are profited by having clear operational expectations set and the piece you're referring to is what it's called um it's a tribute to my friend doug kendall who passed away many years ago yes. but but doug and i at one point we we were working together from two separate organizations trying to put a junketing program for state and federal judges run by oil companies we're trying to put it out of business and like, you know, six years into this 10 year odyssey, we ended up putting one of the two of them out of business. But it, wow. it, in, in it's a six year, Doug turned to me and said, you know, the hardest thing about doing this work is you got to work your ass off to work your ass off. You got to kind of like to get to the work table <laughs> is actually really hard because you have yeah. lesser minds and, cl and, 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 and the timid and the principal loserism crowd that just doesn't want to do things. And when Doug passed, I just, I had a shift. I remember like it was yesterday, I remember walking out of his memorial service and I looked up at the sky and I said, I'm done. I, Cause my ethic until that time was I'll work with anybody or for anybody who's gonna give me agency, so to speak, to yeah. help move the sustainability needle. And after that I said, I'm done. I will no longer work with or for the dramatic, the dishonest and the dysfunctional, the 3D rule. Love and, it. And, and I, and it's just it roll it. We apply it. We have embedded it into our employee handbook. We it is an absolute standard for vendors, and I also apply it to clients and I apply it to me. So, if your our employee handbook says you may not resolve interpersonal differences with your thumbs or your fingertips, you have to put your big kid pants on, and get on the phone or Zoom with Lee and say, Lee, hey, look, I'm having an issue with you. I just I need your I want you to help me. Like, I want to right size this. Let's keep. We call it keeping the floor clean, because yeah. this works stressful. It, it's. Sure. PR, I think I don't know if you remember, but CNBC pre-pandemic used to rate the ten most stressful professions in America, and being an agency owner was routinely in the top five. Like it's really, <laughs> it's yeah, it's really hard to do. You know? yeah, <laughs> right. it, it's it's great. You know, it's hard. So the yeah. work has got an inherent amount of stressfulness to it, and so if you don't have like culture within team where. We're, 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 we're avoiding being passive aggressive because we're willing to be direct in a, um, in a commitment to keep the floor clean. If you're not doing that, you're just building in a drag coefficient. And it also, the most uncomfortable place to apply to is to clients. So if you, if you feel, sure. if you have a sense of scarcity in your revenue stream, you are going to be averse to draw lines. We're not. And so we are not. And I fired a client last year because the CEO flamed my staff twice. And I, I told them going in, we don't do flames. The yeah. CEO flamed my my account lead. I had to call the CEO and say, look, sir, it was a man. I, I let your team know. I let you know. No go. Like, you can always pick up the phone Good and call you. me. You got an issue. But you don't get, well, you know, I pay for that. I said, no, you don't. It's not in the contract. <laughs> it's not the way we roll. And, yeah. and dude... It can't happen again. Like, I just want to be really clear. Like, because the only leverage you have as service providers withholding service, courtesy Blair Inns. That's it. That's all you get. Yeah. And so that's the only leverage we get. And so he did it again because I could tell he wasn't, he just couldn't help himself. And we fired him. 
and it was and that was you know we weren't given the tip of our finger that was an organ we had to hand over but it was like you know i just i have found wow. that looking back over 39 years it's the times when i shut up for the revenue if i i swallowed a sense of right and wrong and didn't walk away those are the ones that stick in my craw <laughs> and it's not about being right it's just about knowing that you punked out like fundamentally you punked out on who you were yeah. and and i say that ultimately it's as an agency head we can contribute to a better functioning business environment if we say we're not putting up with your bullshit we're just not going to put up with your bullshit. You don't get to move goalposts and pretend like you didn't say something and ignore contract <laughs> delivery. Like, look, Matt, Lord, we're here for you. We're, we're committed to your success. But if you're going to invade, engage in dysfunctional behavior and we're not, that means by definition, we're more committed to your success than you are. And when I'm more committed to your success than you are, I become an idiot. <laughs> I just do, that... you know, like, like the, the second we get to that oh. threshold, I'm now an idiot because I'm yeah. more committed to, that's okay if, when you're parenting, that's okay, but these are not parenting <laughs> relationships, you know, these right. are like collegial relationships. So to be clear, like, I, I mean, this is not happy talk. We, I deeply admire 80, 90% of the people that we work for. Hell, I admire a good 60, 70% of the people who even reach out to us and inbound leads that aren't a good fit. Like they're yeah. just, these are like deeply admirable people. And even when client points of contact, they get a little scratchy or they're difficult or they, they kind of like, they, they say things that are, you know, not thoughtful in the moment. I know that these folks past the gut check level like they're good folks so we're talking about a, a fraction of the people that we deal with and yeah. you're just going to have a cleaner soul if you say i'm sorry we don't roll that way you'll note on this communication when we started we didn't do it i we have a team member alex peterson he calls it tap on the sign hey remember we said this <laughs> that's, that's a standard. And so, you know, it's a, it's, nice. a, it's a really good way, I think, of it's a way of clearing away the underbrush so you can get to the work table and be the best comms counselor and executor you can be. That's fantastic. That's a great way to end this. And um, invaluable advice throughout all this, Mike. Thank you so much for being on. Let me just one more thing. If there is anything that you want folks to know going on in Tiger Comms world, we're, as I said, we're going to get all the links. If you want to contact Mike, you can find that on his site. But anything else, Mike, you want folks to know? Yeah, and it's not about me. It's about you. I want to take this opportunity to give you and Mark a shout out. Oh, Seriously. Like I'm not, you know, I, I think you, we do this profession a significant ongoing service by being willing to say things that need to be said and coaching us on how to do agency new business better. And in my opinion, as praiseworthy as you find my content stream, it's equally so from your shop. And I just wanna give you guys a shout out on your show, unprompted, and no, I didn't send you this in oh. advance. No, but, I, I, but you seriously, <laughs> but, but you're, you're, you're doing, I think folks like you, Blair Enns, David Baker, Carl Sakis, you do us a massive ongoing service. And many of us who benefit will never put a dollar in your pocket. <laughs> so I'm saying just on behalf of everybody out there who profits from your content stream, I'm just, I'm volunteering to give you a thanks. So thumbs oh, up to thank you, you, man. Thank you so much. Yeah, man. Oh, thank you. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's great. Yeah. Just, uh, trading the things that we do and, uh, folks, you need to go to the site. You need to read Mike's content, whether you're in that space or not. Uh, some great examples of just ways to do it right. And uh, I encourage you to go do it. So Mike, thanks again. And uh, we'll be talking. Are you going to tell Lee, are you going to tell about our secret museum project of the really bad spam pitches that we, that we've been collecting? <laughs> See, here's the thing. Nobody knows about do Lee. Something with it. Here's what nobody knows about Lee McKnight. He is not just a musician and not just a really good <laughs> agency to business developer. He has a collection mostly submitted by me of the yeah. worst of sales pitches. And I, and we need to get a petition going we do to Lee to say to start offering up um, a, a redacted form of the worst 
of what not to do. And so, Lee, I'm just outing you as the, as this covert museum collector. And I want I, I'm starting I'm putting my first name on the petition that you that you start talking about these examples. I do keep them all and uh, we should do something with them. And again, especially your replies to them. And they're not uh, they're I mean, they are some are snarky and rightful and as they should be. But they're great. And I, I really I, I asked you the other day, you sent me one, I believe. And I, I think I asked you, like, do they ever reply back? And I think nope. you said no. And I, I was like, I wish they would. <laughs> they should be thanking you, honestly. So I don't know. It, yeah. it is awesome. But uh, we will do something with those. Yes. Put All right, Mike. On. Thank you so much. You don't know I was going to put you on the spot, Lee, but there you go. <laughs> <I didn't. laughs> thank you, my friend. All right. Thank you. Take care. Bye now.